Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everybody. Salam sejahtera untuk semua. Good evening to all of the participants. Tonight we meet in the event and seminar of management neurotrauma. My name is Dr. Teddy Apriawan. I'm a neurosurgeon specialist from Elanga University. And I am very interested in field or neurotrauma, infection, and neurointensive care. And I will be your first moderator. The second moderator is Dr. Tito. And good evening, Dr. Tito. Dr. Tito, I will be the host and you are the second moderator. Dr. Rito will help me in this event. Yeah, thank you, Dr. So, Teddy. Okay, so you can see that now the number of participants is 1,016, still rising. Very, quite massive, I think. And if the, the participant want to say hello, you can use and write in text message. Before we start, I think I will give some introducing about the speaker and the panelists that we have appointed in this event. I will uh, share screen. Okay. So you, we, uh, so you can see that we have uh, four speaker tonight, and the first one is from. Department of Neurosurgery of University Ailanga, Dr. Sutom Hospital, uh, Professor Abdul Hafid Pajamal. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Hafid. And the second one is Dr. Angelus Kolias, MD, PhD, from Clinical Lecture of in Neurosurgery. He is from uh, University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. And Prof. Hafid and Dr. Angelus Kolias is a committee in NISL Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma. The third speaker, Muhammad Faris, MD, PhD, Fellowship of Indonesian Neuro Spine Society, Head of Spine Division from Elanga University, Surabaya. Good evening, Dr. Faris. Then we have Dr. Rohadi from Lombok. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Rohadi is a chairman for Indonesian Medical Association in Mataram region. And from, for, the fan, for the panelists, we have Dr. Wiastaw, Surya Nintias. Good evening, Dr. Wiastaw from Elanga University. Then we have Dr. Yuris Paktiar, MD, PhD, from National Diponegoro Hospital, Semarang, Indonesia. Good evening, Dr. Yuris. We have Dr. Hanif Godang Tobing, MD, PhD, from Department of Neurosurgery, University of Indonesia. Good evening, Dr. Hanif. Good malam, Dr. And Dr. Ahmad Farid from uh, MDPSD from Department of Neurosurgery, University of Pajajaran, Bandung. Good evening, Dr. Ahmad Farid. Uh, before we start, I think uh, we try to talk a little bit about neurotrauma. As you can see in here, that we have a very, very in interesting uh, topic. Dr. Dito has remind you about that. And all of it will be given by the professional lecturer, especially from Cambridge, Dr. Angelus Kolias. Uh, Okay. I think for the first session, I think for the first session, uh, will there is there will be a two speaker from Alang University Surabaya Indonesia and from Cambridge University of United Kingdom. And if there is a question from the participant to the speaker in this first session will be given when two speakers have finished their presentation at the end of this session. Participants can type your question in this chat message and we will choose two until three interesting questions because our limited time and I will ask question to the speaker. After that, two from our panelists will help to answer this question. For the first presentation, Professor Abdul Hafid Bajamal with Title of Pre-Hospital Management and Referral Protocol of Traumatic Brain Injury in Developing Country. Professor Hafid, 
I think time and place is yours. Can you see my slide? Hello, can you see my slide? Yes, of course. Yes, prof. of course. Okay. okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the, organi organi uh, the organizing committee and the moderator. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I would like to thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Angelus Colias, for his willingness to join us uh, tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Colias. I hope your present will be continue uh, with our collaboration uh, next time. And also to all uh, uh, panelists from Bandung, Jakarta, Semarang, and Surabaya. Uh, thank you very much. And also the most important thing to all of the participants. Thank you for your uh, enthusiastic uh, join us. Uh, I would like today to present pre-hospital management and referral protocol of traumatic brain injury in developing countries. So you see, the motorcycle is uh, the killer of the young generation. They are not ready to drive. And also, they don't understand the risk. The most risk uh, people now in Indonesia is the younger. And one of the killer is the motorcycle. You see, this is uh, one day in Indonesian holiday. You can see uh, a lot of uh, motorcycle. That, that's because the uh, local transportation or uh, mass transportation is limited. Now, let me see what is the acute trauma brain injury. Acute traumatic brain injury is a form of acquired head injury occur when a sudden trauma causes damage to the brain. If not damage to the brain, there is no sign of the brain injury or damage. Uh, that's not uh, a brain damage. That's uh, not brain damage. Usually, the primary brain lesion happen with injury directly during injury. A secondary brain injury related to the inflammation and biochemical changes will begin minutes of the primary injury and may last several hours, days in contributing to the final outcome. Now, I will to discuss uh, material, the magnitude. I will first explain about what is the problem, why we need to talk about the pre-hospital care, and then how it is the transfer, and when we have to select the hospital and the conclusion. In the magnitude of the problem, we will talk about epidemiology mechanism and outcome. Now, TB affects differences in outcome between high income country and low middle income countries. The worldwide is about 14,000 trauma deaths per day. 90% of death due to TBI occur in low and middle income country. And the experience of low middle income country is uh, three times more cases than high income country. So TBI is still the leading cause of death and disability in developing countries. Disorder to physical, cognitive, and behavior. Now let's see the journal from day one from India about the global incident of traumatic brain injury. You can see that the most cases in Southeast Asia, Western Pacific, and Africa. How about the epidemic in low-income in country? The most is traffic, traf, road traffic injury with two-wheelers involved in 79%. Uh, 
the moderate and severe is more than 50 percent the major urban areas also have a loosely networked trauma system and an emergency medical service personnel and unequipped ambulance and the patient transported to the definitive hospital in ambulance of only in 65 percent it is but none of them receive any care in the form of vital monitoring, intravenous fluid administration, and airway protection at the site of trauma and during transportation. That's according to the new journal in 2018 from MENA, from Jaipur, India. Now, the trauma mechanism now in high-income country is changes, shifted to indoor trauma and falls. The mild is more until 70, 90% of trauma TBI. It is different with the low income country. 35% were elderly patients more than 65 years with mortality 41%. The clinical manifestation may take longer due to the brain atrophy. And often the patient take anticoagulants and platelets. And TBI, this drug may aggravate the initial lesion and resulting in large space occupying intracranial bleeding. Let's see the mechanism and pathology. Direct impact depends on several factors, bone elasticity, surface, power, and speed. Let's see, this is uh, impact with small surface, with a very pinpoint surface. Now, the, the the injury depends on the power and the speed. More power, more deeper injury. It also the impact and focalization. You can see if there is a focalization, it can be two kinds of uh, injury happen. First is you can see not so much dif difficulty in the brain, but in this kind with fracture, you can see Contusional hybrid inside due to the push of the brain by the part of the bone and cause of bleeding. Impact on the moving head is more dangerous because there is acceleration and deceleration injury. And injury are more likely to occur at the base because the base of skull is more protrusion here. And this cause problem contusional in the frontal and temporal area. You can see there is a CT scan with intracerebral bleeding. Indirect impact, because usually in a motorcycle accident, there is a complex uh, uh, force and complex, uh, and there is also a rotational impact injury and shifting of the brain layer and more cause of the diffuse external injury. It causes more coma, more than six weeks. But multiplication can happen in one patient in motorcycle incident because it's a several impacts. Because the patient got several impacts. You can see there is an extradural hematoma here. There is also intracerebral contusional hemorrhage in the frontal, contusional and temporal. That's, that's in one patient. And, you, and now we have, what is important? There is usually the open injury have better prognosis than closed head injury. You can see this is a, a terrible condition. You can see the open injury. But if you compare with closed head injury like this, more survival in an open injury if you compare with the closed head injury. Now, associated injury in TBI. Major trauma patient will also have extremity, chest, abdominal, pelvic, and cervical spine injury. You can see from this driver, there will be many injuries in his body because of the collision. The associated open wound in the arm and every bruising should be suspicious of injury inside. This is bruising in the abdomen, suspicion of intra-abdominal bleeding. And you can see a bruising here. You have to speak of injury inside. 
This is a multiple fracture of the costa clavicula, and then a pneumonia, a pneumothorax. A different with this, you see pneumothorax in this side because of the fracture. This is the fracture, the fracture, and also associated fractures is uh, frequently is a femur fracture, can be open fracture, can be closed, and this is a cruris fracture. You can see. And also mandibular fracture. This is unilateral, but some sign bilateral. Now you can see also the cervical spine injury. In the x-ray, sometimes you can see, sometimes you have to do CT scan for the cervical. And from the MRI, you can see better contusion of the spinal cord. So what is the factor that influences the outcome? Even in my head injury, there is still risk for complication. The greater the severity, the greater the risk for complication, and this is make a problem to the outcome. So complication can be an ongoing process. And it will be severe from time to time. In acute, sometimes you got the bleeding. In acute phase, you get the bleeding, hydrocephalus infection. And sometimes in chronic phase, the patient got epilepsy, hydrocephalus, and encephalopathy. There is a complication due to delay in transfer of treatment. Although you do the surgery very good, there is, will be still complication. Let's see the case like this, with contusional hemorrhage in the side, with a subdural in the side. The patient, because of delay transfer, he, has, he had... Uh, Surgery 10 hours after accident, and after the accident, you can see the ventricles got larger and caused post-traumatic hydrocephalus. Let's see another case. This is a contusional uh, subdural and laceration cerebri on this side because of delay transfer. After the surgery, you see there is an infarction, a very huge infarction due to post-traumatic infection because of delay of treatment. Now, let's see the process uh, of morbidity and mortality. Actually, the patient sometimes have pre-injury factor, age, comorbid, psychological nutrition, alcohol, uh, chronic uh, alcoholic, antiplatelet agent, antiplatelet prevention, without seat belt, without helmet. And if there is a primary injury, there is, will be a second insult happen due to hypotension, hypoxia, ischemia, intracranial hypotension, vasospasm, seizure, and so forth. And it will make a secondary injury. But this secondary injury can aggravate by inflammation cascade as secondary insult. And also, if there is an intracranial lesion, and the secondary insult will be severe. If the secondary insult is severe, it can make a morbidity and mortality higher. How to prevent this? You need acute intervention. You need acute intervention to resuscitate cardiopulmonary stabilize extracranial and you evacuate intrahematome, maintenance of adequate CPP, normalized ICP, medical therapy, correction coagulopathy, fluid, electrolyte balance, temperature, and nutritional support. It will help to overcome the morbidity and mortality. Now, management TBI does not end with the primary care episode. It will potentially continue for months and years in the future with physical, cognitive, and behavioral rehabilitation. You see, this is eight year observation by Professor Root in 2019. Still in eight years, there is still difficulty in work. Fatigue, emotional problem, memory, slowness in work. And there is also, after eight years, still memory problem, concentration problem due to the traumatic brain injury. How to improve the TBI outcome? First is early risk factor for an favorable outcome. You have to know, besides the severity of the trauma, you have to know. Evaluate the pupil reflex, age, hypotension, hypoxemia, hypothermia. 
this is the outcome, uh, the factors that can make an unfavorable outcomes. The risk factor may be decreased with optimal pre-hospital care, reaching the victim in the shortest possible time, evacuating them to the hospital, taking care ABC and perfusion, maintaining them during the transportation, and depending on the skill of the medical team. So the K is uh, no delay to secure the patient. Now, what is the pre-hospital care? It's important care that like in Surabaya, we have a quick response team, which consists of doctor, nurse, and volunteer, which stand by 24 hours. And we have a common center, 2112, for all type of emergency. If there is a traffic accident, then they will send an ambulance from the near hospital to the on-site and help the patient with the infusion, blood pressure, ABC, and then transport the patient to the nearest hospital. Now, the airway breathing uh, control is involved, determined in resolve ABCD during insight. Airway breathing control with oxygen mass is important. Secure the airway, keep the SpO2 95%. You have to extra attention to the chest movement when the patient is breathing to see the symmetrical of the moving of the chest. And hypoxemia may be related to aspirations, aspiration or thorax injury. And sometimes it occurs very early, so you have to prevent the aspiration. And pre-hospital intubation is controversial. That's why now we don't use a pre-hospital intubation uh, with a quick uh, response team. Secure cervical spine and all the spine with the collar for the cervical is important also. If there is an hypertension, this may be because of sympathetic activation. But if in the scan you find an hypotension, then you have to think in mind there's a possibility of a hypovolemia. And if there is an hypovolemia, there must be additional trauma because 30% of patients with TBI combined with multiple trauma. So if there is a visible bleeding control, you need to splint the fracture, you need to give a, a physiologic salt. Japan Trauma Data Bank, uh, that the standard of blood pressure in Japan patient below 60 year is 120, uh, above 60 year is 130. But our standard is um, it should be more than 100 millimeter mercury. If no bleeding found, then still there is a hypotension, then you can start with vasopressure. Now, hypotherma related usually to uncontrolled bleeding. So the problem usually from the bleeding. From the first time, you have to keep the patient warm, prevent hypothermia because it makes a pure outcome to the patient and give mortality. Now, then make a diagnosis on the scan from the neurologic evaluation, Glasgow Coma Scale, Cooper Reaction in Asymmetry, about the fetal sign, and after you try to uh, secure the resuscitation, and search for other lesson from head to toe is important. Now, preparing for transfer. ABC must be safe, monitor before and during transportation. You have to monitor Glasgow comma scale, pupillary size, reaction to light before and during transportation. SpO2, blood pressure, ACG, urine output. Use urine catheter if you can do it. Move the patient by three, four people by a lock roll if need for when flat mat. But the important fundamental requirement is this. Never move the patient, never transfer the patient if this is not uncontrolled. Now, the question is, is, is intubation necessary on the scan? Because sometimes it's difficult to intubate during transfer if there is something happen. So you have to guarantee that no minutes airway can be interrupted during transportation. 
because of uh, tongue fall backward, mucus, vomit, material blood, position of the head, injury of oral or facial agitated or seizure. Now, indication for trial intubation is the glass control lower than nine or progressive deteriorated glass control more than two, failure to achieve SpO2 50%. 95% bilateral fracture mandibular and this cupious bleeding into the mouth from the skull base and from uh, maxillary or mandibular fracture. And if the patient with seizure, then there's indication for trial intubation. Like the case like this, there is a risk airway obstruction. So search for the bleeding point, secure the bleeding, think over Think about mandibular maxillary fracture. You cannot secure the air. If you cannot secure it, then you need to intubate. This is essential equipment to have to be in the ambulance. Store in suitable can require regularly restocking and checking. This is the ambulance with everything, include defibrillator, intubation set, oxygen, enough for a few hours. And this is the drug important, midazolam, analgetic, diazepam, manitol, epidine, and NACL 0.9%. Patient transfer, preparing the patient transfer, the maximum prevention of all secondary insult risk. The patient should be positioned in the trolley and secure with padded, maintain spinal equalization with 20 to 30 grade head up. Decide which hospital to be transferred. The receiving hospital should be made aware and will be made aware of time of arrival. The patient relative notify about destination, the reason for transportation and the destination. Normally, no accompany adult patient in the ambulance. But for the child, the parents should be accompanying the child in the ambulance. Now, care monitoring during transfer must continue oxygenation, blood pressure, minimizing rises of ICP, recording all vital neurologic conditions, glaucoma, pupil reaction. The children is important prone to hypoglycemia. This you have to check the glucose in transportation, during uh, transportation. Documentation is very important. As far as possible, it should be a small journey because if you don't do this, this may be make a problem to the patient. The staff should be remain seated with the steel belt in place. Arrival and handover. Staff the primary house should be immediately available because you have already informed them. And this is uh, arrive in a hospital and in triage handover with documentation. And then the patient, uh, the note, and copy of transfer records should be left for the receiving staff. Now, let's selection of the hospital. What if in the hospital nearby there is no neurosurgeon available? Primary consultant should be a general neurosurgeon. Why? Because 30% of the patient with TBI accompanied by multi-trauma, 50% accompanied by cervical injury, and ATLS and BSS basic surgery has been trained and accustomed in handling experience. Usually they have the surgeon already got this uh, training and they can easily make a secure airway, a breathing oxygenation. They can do needle trichotereotomy, trihostomy, and needle pneumothorax if that happens. And usually the general surgeon can manage hypovolemic shock better and faster. They can manage the open wound because more than 60% TBI has an open wound. Finding the treat of the cause of the bleeding and manage and close fracture and pelvic fracture. That's why we have to choose the general surgeon. Transfer to which hospital? Mild should be going to the nearest hospital for observation. A moderate and severe it should be going to the neurosurgical facility where there is a neurosurgeon available and CT scan. But unstable patient with unstable vital function should go to the nearest hospital. Alert patient with suspected of thorough abdominal injury should be going to the nearest hospital for the general, general neurosurgeon. General surgeon. The nearest hospital consists of an emergency unit, surgeon, x-ray, and laboratory. 
Now let's see, there is th three types of hospital. First is the nearest hospital. They don't have CT scan, they have just only general surgeon. And the other is hospital with CT scan with nearest surgeon. But the third one is the trauma center level one with hospital. Now, there is a kind of patient with always alert since the first ABC stable, a brain injury is in doubt, then you have, you have also another patient with unconscious, which is ABC unstable, and you have also unconscious patient with ABC stable. There's three kinds of patient condition. Now, when you have the patient like this, then you can better send to the nearest hospital because they can do observation here. If there is something happen, a condition deteriorate, then they can send to the at the hospital. If you have a patient with unconscious disease, unstable, as fast as you can send to the general surgeon to make the ABC stable. And after there is already stable, and then he can send to the general, uh, to neurosurgeon. If you have a patient with unconscious, with the ABC stable, then you can directly send to the City with uh, to the hospital neurosurgeon, or if you possible time enough, you can send to the level one trauma center. And you can also, if there is the patient something happen here, they can send still send to the trauma center. Now, what if the patient have a complex problem in this hospital? The neurosurgeon can send also to the trauma center. And if there is an alert patient with a suspect of abdominal thorax trauma. It's very dangerous and better you send it first to the general surgeon at the nearest hospital to, to make a secure the multi-trauma because it can make a hypotension. In Indonesia, we have a different problem. We have 17,500 islands, so we have an archipelago largest hospital in the world. We have we shift in seven in five hundred island. So it's not easy by land transportation. And also the neurosurgeon is not, not it's distributed evenly. The TBI case is handled by our college general surgeon in the nearest hospital. Sometimes and many times patient transported using motorboat, ship, heli or airplane. So they can use airplane, they can use heli, they can, we have an also an Air Langa, we have university, we have a ship like this to go to the islands and ambulance like this. The, the similar preparation we transfer patient on land. But there is some consideration, there is high attitude, less air mineral oxygen, the possible hypoxia, you have to keep in mind, barrel trauma due to the high altitude, they may to tympanic membrane, rupture of sinus, dissension of diaphragm, atrial thoracic hemodynamic, you need ICP control, you have to keep in mind about the temperature, vibration, noise, is the crisp of humidity, and also in, in motorboat and ship transport, there is a risk of sea wave, noises, vibration, seasickness, and need to the control of ICP. So the conclusion is TBI morbidity and mortality is very high. Integrated healthcare management of TBI is essential for improving outcome. Skilled, highly trained healthcare provider over the whole, the whole chain of brain trauma care including pre-hospital emergency care, will contribute to improve the result. Prevention is the most important. So the traffic accidental prevention must be a joint task between the government, the police, Department of Transportation in the country, and also Department of Health. Now, conclusion and recommendation. Pre-hospital care determine the outcomes. That's very important. Results, Resuscitation stabilization before and during transport in all forms of transportation should be done and make it secure. Avoid transportation of a hypotension epoxy. Never transfer the patient in this condition. Glass coma scale on the crystal point 
you have to think about intubation. Monitoring during transport, communication during transport with the safe hospital, with the consultant, you to keep, if there is changes, then you can help during transportation. TBI should be accompanied by a trained medical team. Choosing the right referral hospital can avoid delay. Thank you very much. I hope uh, it can help uh, for the help for the patient with pre hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abdul Bakit Pajamal, for question and answer. I think after the second speaker. So from now, I think this is the time for us to have some question and answer questionnaire from host our Tito. Uh, Dito, do you uh, ready for your question and answer questionnaire? Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Teddy and Professor Abdul Hafid. And now we are in quiz session. True or false, but uh, pardon me, this session is not to our speaker, moderator, and panelists, just only for our attendee. And I will share the polling. Yep. Okay. Um, please fill the polling just only true or false. And there are consists of the question that you can just answer by clicking it. And we have only one minute to vote. First, the goal of airway breathing circulation stabilization prior to the transport of TBI patient to prevent the secondary TBI. And the second one is, um, is intubation necessary for all TBI patients, um, even to mild, moderate, or severe TBIs. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your time for one minute. Untuk Profesor Hafid, mungkin uh, akan membantu kami untuk menjawab pertanyaan nomor satu dan nomor dua, Prof. Ya. Uh, kita menunggu nanti persentase, uh, persentase dari para panelis, uh, dari ya. para panelis dan para partisipan seberapa banyak uh, jawaban yang benar. Setelah itu Profesor Hafid akan membantu sedikit untuk menjelaskan. Uh, mungkin satu lagi dari panelis, uh, Dr. Farid dari Bandung mungkin bisa membantu kami untuk sedikit memberi uh, ilmu kepada kami mengenai nomor satu dan nomor dua. Kita menunggu dari para partisipan untuk mendapatkan hasil persentase terakhir. Okay. Kira-kira berapa lama dokter itu untuk menunggu hasil persentase semuanya? Ya, uh, waktunya sudah cukup, sudah selesai. And okay, the time is up. I will close the polling. And I will share the result. Okay. Yeah. Um, the number one, the goal of airway, breathing, circulation, and stabilization prior to the transport of TB patients to prevent the secondary brain injury, um, about uh, 90% of uh, voters to vote the true. And uh, number two, intubation is necessary for all TB patients. It's all about uh, 90% uh, voters vote their false. Just please give the any suggest for all our our other presenter and yes, analysts. Yes, excellent, excellent, excellent uh, answer because uh, this is a good answer. Ninety six percent for the uh, question number one. Yes, that's to prevent secondary injury from the beginning, and uh, intubation. Even experienced uh, person cannot easier to do intubation in the field or in the ambulance. So intubation is very uh, uh, strict for the very indication uh, condition. So yes, Professor, uh, there is a, maybe, uh, there is a question from the, the participant for number two. If we cannot use intubation, what we can do to protect our airway and breathing, Professor, for number two? No, you have many uh, kind of uh, technique to do uh, prevention and secure airway. Yes, you have many kind yeah. uh, to the, to control the airway. It's very easy. And then, okay. then, but you, if you come with the ambulance, then usually you have uh, equipment to secure the airway. 
That is important. Baik. Uh, untuk Dr. Farid dari Bandung mungkin dapat membantu kami dalam uh, memberi sedikit masukan kepada kami. Nomor satu dan nomor dua, Dr. Farid. Apakah hadir, Dr. Farid? Nomor Farid ya. dari mana? Hadir. Ya. Uh, minta tolong mas ya. Ini nomor satu dan nomor dua. Mengenai yang pertama adalah bagaimana goal dari airway beating dan circulation stabilization pada pasien TBI. Pasien yang kedua adalah intubasi. Apakah diperlukan pada semua kasus cedera kepala? Terima kasih. Ya. Jadi saya setuju dengan Prof. Hafiz. Rata-rata memang kita semua sudah mendapat uh, dasar-dasar ya tentang uh, uh, A, B, C, D. Jadi semuanya memang menuju kepada kebutuhan otak ya yang sangat apa ya tanda kutip sangat haus akan oksigen dan dia perlu pompa darah yang uh, cukup adekuat ya. Jadi kalau dalam perjalanannya uh, runutannya yang mudah diingat itu ya A, B dan C-nya tertangani dengan baik itu dia akan sangat mencegah uh, hipoksia yang akan disebabkan bila kita tidak aware terhadap penanganan uh, yang sangat diperlukan oleh otak. Jadi uh, sangat baik, 96% sudah sangat paham. Dan saya rasa pengetahuan ini harusnya juga di-sharing kepada uh, orang-orang yang akan bekerja di pre-hospital. Tadi Prof. Hafid bilang, melibatkan orang dari Departemen Perhubungan, melibatkan polisi, melibatkan uh, pemerintahan, gitu ya, swasta mungkin. Karena saat ini ambulans bukan hanya dari pihak e, pemerintah, swasta gitu ya, e, partai politik semua punya ambulans. Tapi permasalahannya mereka e, faham tidak gitu untuk menangani on the spot gitu ya. Kemudian untuk intubasi, saya setuju dengan Prof. Hafid, itu yang harus dimiliki oleh first respondent yang datang pertama kali ke e, tempat kejadian e, kecelakaan atau permasalahan uh, di tempat gitu ya uh, itu nanti kembali lagi terhadap judgement orang yang akan melakukan dan tidak semuanya harus dilakukan intubasi permasalahannya kadang-kadang ambulan itu hanya uh, datang beserta supirnya gitu ya uh, ya mungkin ada yang dengan dokter kalau dengan dokter dokternya harus bisa memutuskannya uh, physiciannya uh, scope and run gitu bawa cepat ke tempat yang terdekat, jadi tidak dilakukan di tempat atau stay and play. Dia berani melakukan di sana dengan kualifikasinya. Jadi semuanya memang tergantung dari decision maker yang ikut di tempat kejadian. Tetapi betul seperti yang tertera di sana, tidak semuanya harus dilakukan intubasi. Tetapi kalaupun harus dilakukan, dia harus dilakukan uh, oleh orang yang memiliki kompetensi. Ya, mungkin terima kasih. Baik, terima kasih Dr. Fawid. Mungkin satu lagi ya, untuk dari panelis Dr. Yuris Bahtiar dari Semarang. Ini PSD, beliau lulusan dari Jepang untuk neurosurgery-nya. Mungkin Dr. Yuris dapat membantu. Uh, apakah itu, untuk nomor dua Dr. Yuris, apakah itu basi is necessary for all TBI patient? Uh, emang itu basi ini, saya setuju dengan Dr. Fawid Bajamal tadi di kuliahnya mengatakan bahwa indikasi intubasi itu tergantung dari kondisi klinik. Tidak semua traumatic brain injury itu nanti akan dilakukan intubasi karena tergantung apakah ada gangguan RW atau tidak. Karena resiko tindakan intubasi sendiri tidak 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 beresiko juga. Maksudnya dia punya resiko juga untuk jadi komplikasi cedera pada trachea dan laring terutama. Jadi saya pikir Prof. Hafid Uh, Prof. Hafid tadi mengatakan bahwa indikasi berapa indikasi salah satunya adalah gluskokuma skill. Atau kan gluskokuma skill kurang dari 9 ini saya pikir sangat-sangat sangat bermanfaat, terutama ada area di daerah yang dimana saya juga temui di daerah salah tiga, bahwa memang uh, pasien-pasien itu menjadi buruk pada saat dikirim dengan kondisi GCS kurang dari 9, tetapi tidak ada secure terhadap RW. Artinya apa? Intubasi itu pada GCS yang kurang dari 9 itu sesuatu hal yang sangat penting. Ya, itu saya sangat setuju dengan apa yang yeah. dokter 
Amat baik ya. Ya baik. Mungkin satu ya satu lagi panelis ya dari Dr Hanif dari Universitas Indonesia. Mungkin bisa memberi kita masukan juga Dr Hanif dari Universitas Indonesia. Apakah hadir Dr Hanif? Ya. Ini pertanyaannya mengenai apakah perlu intubasi pada TBI ya? Ya, nomor dua Dr. Hanif. Intubation ya. is necessary for all TBI. Kalau all sih jelas enggak, kalau all ya. Tentunya kan ada kriterianya juga, misalnya berapa jauh tuh mau ditransfer misalnya. Dia TBI yang severe gitu ya, tapi berapa jauh hospitalnya. Kalau misalnya hospitalnya uh, 10 menit atau setengah jam tercapai, saya rasa enggak perlu diintubasi gitu, pasang tubel itu udah memadai gitu. Tapi pada tempat-tempat tadi seperti Prof. Hafid bilang bisa dia mesti berpakai helikopter dibawa jauh gitu ya dan dia uh, GCS-nya rendah mungkin perlu dipertimbangkan untuk dilakukan untuk intubasi itu menurut saya sih terima kasih ya baik terima kasih Dr. Hanif jadi uh, untuk intubasi kita melihat tergantung dari kondisi dan situasi di lapangan yang kita bisa uh, lakukan saat itu jika kita memang mempunyai kemampuan untuk melakukan intubasi dan memang dibutuhkan maka dibutuhkan bila tidak ya memang bukan waktu dan saatnya kita melakukan intubasi kita bisa melakukan secure airway dan breathing menggunakan oksigenasi yang lain